Hello, welcome to this brief follow up to the session that we had on mountaineering monks, pancakes and continuous functions, the intermediate value theorem and some existence proofs. And I'm going to discuss a couple of very interesting questions that were asked following the session. So here we go. Um, the first question was related to the theorem that we discussed about the existence of a line that simultaneously bisects both the perimeter and area of a simply connected two-dimensional shape. And we proved this using two applications of the intermediate value theorem. So I put the theorem up on the, on the screen so that, you can, so that you can have a look at it. And the question, which came in two parts, was the following. So what happens if we have certain kinds of shape where if you draw a line across the shape, then it splits it into more than two pieces, right? And so the example that was given in the question was this kind of U-shaped domain, which you can see on the left-hand side. And of course, if you draw a blue line, as you can see here, then it splits the shape into three pieces, right? One on the left and two on the right. And of course, if we have more complicated, wiggly type domains, then we could possibly divide it into more than three pieces using a single line. OK, and so as the person who asked the question uh, correctly pointed out, the reasoning that we gave during the session still applies to domains of this type. One just has to think through carefully how it works. OK, and so for example, if you take one of these U-shaped domains, in the first part of our proof, we took two points on the edge, X and Y, and we looked at the difference between the length of the edge going from X to Y uh, clockwise, which is given by the green part here, minus the length going from X to Y anti-clockwise, which is given by the red part. And we use the fact that that gives a continuous function and the intermediate value theorem to deduce that there must be some point x star such that g of x star is equal to zero. In other words, it takes the same length to go either anticlockwise or clockwise. OK, and so then we might have a picture that looks like something on the right hand side. Right. So we have x and we have this point x star. And then we draw the blue line in between them. Um, and then we have Bx on the left, right? And so Bx is the area of the part that we have on the left-hand side, whereas Cx is the area of the part that we have on the right-hand side, OK? And given what we have here, Cx corresponds to two different pieces. But that's OK for the argument that we have, OK? OK, so we can deal with shapes of this type. But um, a good question is, are there results that say that for certain shapes of domain, we know that we end up with more than two pieces? So this is something that's a little bit complicated. So in principle, it should indeed be possible to prove some results like this. But the conditions are likely to be quite complicated, right? And so, for example, if you look at the two uh, sort of U-shaped domains on the left of the screen, one of them is much fatter than the other one, right? And without being too precise about it, with the one on the top, the fatter one, we would expect that um, if we take the line that simultaneously bisects the perimeter and the area, we would expect that it probably goes through the fat part and it would divide the shape into two pieces. Whereas with the sort of narrower U-shape underneath, we would expect that it probably will divide it into three pieces, right? But in order to give precise conditions that uh, distinguishes one from the other, it's not so easy. And I'm not aware of nice results of this type. But it certainly could be a fun thing for you to think about um, if you're interested to do that. On the other hand, uh, the second part of the question was, are there conditions on the shape that ensure that we end up with two pieces? And the answer to that is yes. And this brings in the notion of a convex shape. And so we say that a shape is convex if given any two points, which we'll call x1 and x2 in the shape, the line in between x1 and x2 lies entirely in the shape. Okay. So if you look at the two pictures we have at the top right of the screen, 
one of them is convex, right? So I take x1 and x2 in the shape, the blue line also lies in the shape. Whereas the one on the right is not convex because we can take two points x1 and x2 such that the line in between them lies outside the shape. And it's easy to see, given that definition, that if A is in fact a convex, simply connected two-dimensional shape, then a line joining any two points on the boundary must cut A into two pieces. And that's enough to say that the line that uh, chops the shape into two parts where the two parts have the same perimeter and the same area must indeed chop the, the shape into two pieces. Okay, okay. so thank you very much for that very uh, nice question. And then we had a second question, also an extremely nice question, uh, which related to the last part of the talk. And in the last part of the talk, I was uh, relating the intermediate value theorem and the notion of continuous functions to the completeness of R. And so just to remind you, so the completeness of R is to do with the fact that R doesn't have any holes in it in some technical sense. And while I was introducing this concept, I was talking about a function f, which was defined only on the integer, right? So just to recap, I've put that slide on the screen. And the point was that in this case, it's, it's no longer true that if f is negative, somewhere and positive somewhere else, it's zero in between. And so I gave an example of a function um, which I claim to be continuous, which is negative at some integer and positive at another integer, but there's no integer for which f of x is equal to zero, right? And the question was, how can a function defined on the integers be continuous, right? And I interpret this question um, in the sense that uh, when we were talking about uh, continuous functions during the session, our sort of working definition of what it meant for a function to be continuous is that you can draw its graph without taking your pen off the paper, right? And it's clearly the case, the way that I've drawn the graph here is just a series of dots. So of course, I cannot draw it without taking my pen off the paper. And so for this question, there are two answers right so um they're somehow complementary so the first one is the following so one thing that we can do and in a sense I, I had in mind at this point is that we can think of functions that are continuous when we define them on the real numbers right so like the example we looked at f of x is equal to x plus a half if i take x to be a real number certainly i can draw its graph without taking my pen off the paper, that would give me the blue curve. But then after that, I restrict attention to the values of x that are integers, right? So if I restrict attention to the values of x that are integers, these are just the black blobs on the x-axis and they correspond to the red points on the blue curve, okay? Okay, so that's the first and somehow sort of more basic answer. But let me also give you another answer, which is the following, that thinking of continuous functions as being ones that we can draw without taking our pen off the paper is a good working definition uh, to start with. And it gives you pretty good intuition in the case of functions which are defined on the real numbers. But in general, it's a bit too simplistic to capture the whole notion of continuity, right? And in fact, we have a much more precise and more generally applicable definition, which is the following, right? So this is a definition of, of continuity in, in a more general sense. And this is a definition that um, all math students will see at university. And it introduces an extremely important uh, concept called the limit. And it says the following, that a function f is continuous at a point x0 if the limit as x tends to x0 of f of x is equal to f of x0, right? So what does that mean? That means that the value of the function at a given point 
is close to the values of the function at points x which are close to the point x0. Right? So in a sense it doesn't jump about too much. Okay? So this is in fact the rigorous complete definition of what it means for a function to be continuous at a point. There's also a rigorous definition of exactly what we mean by limit, but I won't go into that for the moment. And so what happens with this definition, if we think about the case where we're looking at f defined on the integers, well, with this definition, um, a function defined only on the integers is in fact automatically continuous, right? So that's a slightly philosophical point. But essentially what happens is that if you have x0 to be an integer, well, there are actually no other integers which are close to x0, so f of x0 can be whatever it wants. Okay, so that's one point, right? But let me also discuss this general definition of continuity in the case of the rational numbers, right? So if you remember during the session, we also uh, considered an example of a function which was defined only on the rationals, we claimed that that function is continuous, right? So it was in fact f of x is equal to x squared minus two. We claimed that that function was continuous, but again, the intermediate value theorem doesn't apply because we had a, we had a value uh, where the function was negative, another rational number where the function was positive, but the only point where f of x was equal to zero in between was root two, which is not a rational number, okay? And in that case, um, this definition of continuity using the limits tells us that such a function is indeed continuous if it's only defined on the rational, right? And this is because unlike the integers, so the integers are, are spaced out, but the rational and the irrational numbers, one can prove that they're actually interlaced. In fact, they are, in, if they are interlaced in an extremely fine way, and that means that we can never draw uh, the graph without taking the pen off the paper if we have a function that's defined only on the rationals, but, Given a rational number x0, there are always rational numbers arbitrarily close to x0. So we can work out what is the limit as x tends to x0 of f of x and ask the question whether that is equal to f of x0. Right? And so this definition of, con of continuity gives us a meaning for continuity in the case of functions defined on the rational numbers which extends the sort of heuristic idea that we had of being able to draw the graph without taking our pen off the paper. Because we can never draw the graph of a function which is only defined on the rationals without taking our pen off the paper, but we can have functions defined on the rationals which are continuous in this sense. So thank you again for the excellent questions and bye for now.